Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome again to um, the Deep Learning for Science School. This is the third week of lectures. Um, I'm very pleased to have Aditya Grover here to give us a lecture on deep generative models and their applications to, uh, uh, to science or to some sciences. Um, just a reminder, uh, during the talk, you can ask any questions you have about the content or general questions about the, the topic of the lecture on the Q&A uh, in Zoom. And um, uh, Steve, Wahid and I, the organizers, will be uh, relaying some of these questions to uh, Aditya at the point where he stops for questions. So um, before I start, I'd like to introduce you to Aditya. Aditya Grover is a final year PhD student at Stanford University. He's, uh, his current research is, focuses on probabilistic modeling for representation learning and reasoning in high dimensions. Um, and he also uh, focuses a lot in, uh, on applications in science and sustainability, such as, such as weather forecasting and electric batteries. His work has, been, has appeared in uh, several um, uh, high impact journals and has also been deployed in production by technology companies. He has won many awards uh, and um, um, I, I won't list them here, but um, uh, uh, the one that is most relevant to this talk is uh, he has a, the Stanford Centennial um, Teaching Award, which is, um, so I'm, I'm really happy to have him here giving us a lecture on uh, deep generative models. Um, Aditya, thank you for joining us and you can take the floor. Uh, thanks, Mustafa, for having me here. It's uh, great to be virtually presenting to all of you. Uh, so today I'm going to be giving a quick tutorial about deep generative models, why I think they are exciting, and why they are particularly relevant for bringing about the next age of scientific discovery. Now, in recent years, there's been massive growth in the scale of data and computation in a variety of disciplines. So from physical sciences and material sciences to even the biological sciences. And this scale provides us with an unprecedented opportunity to extract information from data and transform it to useful knowledge. However, it so turns out that in many cases, the raw data that we collect by our sensors is limited by the available supervision we have. For example, this could be labels for prediction and obtaining these kinds of labels as explicit signals of supervision to perform the task at hand can be a very expensive process. They could be cost due to time, money, safety, and so on and forth. Now, there are many ways in machine learning to reduce the supervision requirements, and this is precisely the subject of a number of fields. So, for instance, in classification, we can actively query for labels of points which are close to the decision boundary between two classes. In reinforcement learning, uh, often we have access to only very sparse rewards. So we can try to shape the rewards so as to provide additional proxy signals for learning. Uh, in today's talk, uh, my focus will be on the unsupervised setup, where we'll have no supervision signal for the downstream task. And one question to ask in such a setting is, and how can we learn with no supervision? So first, um, I want to show that it turns out that we can do a lot of amazing stuff, even with unlabeled data. So we can generate high resolution imagery from scratch. All these individuals that you see here have been generated from uh, completely from scratch. These are fictitious people, they don't exist in real life. Uh, many of you might have also seen sometime last year, the AI Google Doodle. So it would allow us to create uh, music of our, in the style of Bach. Bach. Uh, even in the sciences, which is particularly relevant to today's talk, unsupervised learning has led to orders of magnitude improvement in technologies such as MRI and is increasingly being used to discover new drugs and materials. So at the heart of a lot of these advancements in unsupervised learning is the concept of a generative model. So the setup is as follows. We have uh, samples from some unknown distribution for example, we could have pictures of monuments, and we'll assume that these come from some data distribution, P data. And we, our goal is to then approximate this distribution as closely as possible. So in order to do so, we pick a model family M, 
and optimize for a member of this family, B gen, that minimizes some notion of discrepancy with the data distribution. Now, uh, let's look at a very quick example of how this would work. So this is a one dimensional example. So we have sample access to this ground truth distribution, which I've assumed is a mixture of two Gaussians. And here, the first Gaussian is three times more likely than the second one. So we observe more samples from the first mode as opposed to the second mode. So what we're going to do is we'll first then pick some model family M. In this case, we let the model family M to be, let's say a mixture of 1D Gaussians. And then we try to find the generative model within this model family M that best approximates this distribution. So the reason why this model is called generative is because once we have learned this model, we can then obtain samples from this model, or in other words, generate new data at test time. Now, the key challenge in generative modeling is the curse of dimensionality. So often the real world data that we work with, whether it's images, videos, text, or even the different kinds of scientific data that we have, is hardly unidimensional. And the curse of dimensionality really makes things hard in terms of this optimization problem. So intuitively, in high dimensions, we expect that the data distribution will be highly multimodal. And moreover, the finite data set that we have will cover only a very small region of what we expect the true support of the data distribution to be. Now, these challenges have given rise to a variety of different generative models over the last decade or so. And what we're going to see in today's talk next is a roadmap of how we can look at these different families of general models, what are their pros, what are their cons, and what are some of the applications where these models have been applied, particularly with regards to scientific discovery. Okay, so let's start with the first family of generative models, which I'm going to call as likelihood-based generative models. So we've seen a bit what the why they are called likelihood based uh, it's to give to uh, spoil the fun it's really the fact that they're trying to maximize the likelihood of the data or some approximation of it and within this family the first example we're now going to see is the autoregressive models okay so what is an autoregressive generative model it's a directed fully observed graphical model so let's say you have uh, data from uh, which has n dimensions. So x1 to xn are the n dimensions of your data. And what we're going to assume is that every dimension here depends on the previous dimension that appears within some ordering that we choose. So here we just chose the canon canonical ordering by the index x1, x2, so on for x n. And anytime we have uh, one of these x's, it will depend on all the previous uh, uh, x dimensions that appear before it. Okay, so the key idea here is that once we have this graphical model, we can write down its join distribution. So the join distribution of x1, x2, so on, for till xn, in short, if I can write that as just p e theta of x, would be given as the product of conditionals. And in particular, each of these conditions follows the autoregressive property. So the conditional for xi will depend on all the variables that appear before i, index i. Okay. So in short, we can just write this using this notation. Now, I mentioned that this is a likelihood-based generative model. And uh, what uh, this means is that when we are trying to learn this model, so by learning, we want to find the parameters theta. And the objective we'll use to find the optimal parameters theta is to maximize the log likelihood of our data set. So the data set that we have, so these could be the images of monuments that we had a few slides ago. So we'll find these parameters theta, which assign high probability to this data set. Now, if you assume that the data set is ID, we can write this as a sum of log probabilities over each of the points in the data set. And using the autoregressive property, we know that this p theta of x then can be written in this particular form where we have factorized the join distribution as a product of conditionals. You have a log outside, so the product becomes, uh, log of a product becomes the sum of logs, 
and we have this expression with us. Now, the fact that we have tractable conditionals, and we'll see uh, in a few slides which are the various ways in which we can have these tractable conditionals, allows us to then evaluate the likelihoods exactly. So all the conditionals that we have in, that are appearing this objective would be evaluated in parallel during training. Once we have learned this model, so we have found out the best configuration of theta, uh, what we're going to then do is at test time, we want to use this model to generate more data, or in other words, sample. And in order to do so, uh, the fact that it's a directed model helps. So what we're going to do is we're going to sample one variable at a time. So first we'll sample x1. So you can think of x1 as the first pixel of an image. Then we'll sample x2 conditioned on x1. So we'll sample the second pixel that's conditioned on the first pixel of an image. And we'll keep doing this so on and forth until we have completed our image. And that x1 through xn will then be our full image composed of the various pixels that we sampled. Okay, so this is a tutorial about deep generative models. So where is the deep aspect of this? So far we have just looked at how the generative model is represented, but turns out that these conditionals p theta can then be parameterized by neural networks. So, and then there are like many, many ways in which that's possible. So the earliest uh, variants of autoregressive gender models used factorizations which were linear. So they went by the name of fully visible sigmoid belief networks. Uh, over the years, people thought about using uh, neural networks. So in need, there was a one hidden layer neural network that was used to parameterize these conditionals. And uh, this was extended to having multi-layer neural networks in uh, made as well. Um, linear or multi-layer perceptron uh, based parameterizations are not the only ones. So for a lot of high dimensional data, we can use other deep architectures which have other kinds of invariances. For example, for textual data, it's often uh, useful to use an RNN based parameterization. So for instance, if we want to be able to generate text, so what we're gonna do is uh, in this example, we can see we have a string H-E-L-L. -L, so we are in effectively trying to uh, train the model by feeding it the string hello. So what we can have is we'll have an RNN that looks at H and then tries to predict what is the next character going to be. So in this particular example, we are assuming a simple vocabulary where it can just be H, E, L, or O. And the model is going to then try to assign probabilities for each of these different characters. And by training it, we are hoping that it assigns higher probability to strings that are more likely to appear in our training data set. Uh, so this is not just uh, been used for text. So variants of it have also been used for images. So an image, uh, we can think of trying to uh, generate a pixel XI condition on everything that appears before it in a raster scan order. And again, this conditional can be parameterized with a recurrent neural network. Uh, there for uh, other, for data types, many data types also, CNN based parameterizations have been explored. Uh, so pixel CNN is a really good example uh, where the convolutions that are used in normal CNN are masked and the masking is done so that we preserve the autoregressive property. So if you want to predict this pixel here, we only want to be looking at pixels in the nearby region, but nothing that comes after this pixel. And for that purpose, we need to mask the convolution, uh, the convolutional neural networks. Um, so WaveNet is another example that's been used for audio. So in audio, often we want to capture very long range sequences. So here we use 1D convolutions and What's interesting about these 1D convolutions is that they are dilated. So if you look at every hidden layer, uh, we are successively skipping more and more uh, units that come before. So in the first hidden layer, we have a dilation factor of one, which means that if we want to be able to predict an output for the next layer, we will be skipping one of the hidden activations that come before it in the sequence while doing the convolution. 
uh, very recent work, you might have seen demos about it all uh, over the internet, is the use of transformer-based parameterizations. So all those models about GPT are in fact autoregressive models. And the key uh, innovation that has led to such impressive results in uh, those style of models is the use of a transformer-based architecture for parameterizing these conditionals. All right, so this was uh, all I wanted to talk about autoregressive models, which is our first kind of likelihood based generative model. Um, now let's move on to another kind of generative model, which has been used extensively in recent years, which is the variational autoencoding model. But before I go forward to variational encoding, um, if there is any questions at this point, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, seeing none, so let's move on. So let's go to um, the variational autoencoders. Okay, so now variational autoencoders, uh, so we'll again think of them first as a graphical model, and then we'll think about how that graphical model can be used for learning and inference. Okay, so these models are again, directed latent variable models. So the new thing that we have from before is this latent variable Z, so we didn't have a concept of latent variables previously uh, when we were discussing autoregressive models. All we had was a fully connected uh, model over X earlier. But now this latent variable Z, and one should really think of Z as something we don't observe in the data set. So um, anytime we have an image, so that's going to be our X, and Z is something that we do not observe. Now, given this model, which is goes from z to x, uh, we are again interested in a likelihood-based objective. So we saw previously that in a likelihood-based objective, our goal is to maximize the log likelihood of the observed data set. We only observe x's, so what we're really interested in is maximizing the marginal log likelihood of the data set, where marginalization here means summing out all the things we do not observe. So we do not observe Z. So we want to then just marginalize it out while we're trying to learn the parameters theta for this model. Okay. Now, as we see that this is actually going to be a hard problem and which is why I have this dotted arrow here, which is going to be making this problem much more tractable. Okay, so uh, let's not pay too much attention to this, but keep it at the back of our minds that we're going to have an inference network Q, which is going to be helping us optimize this objective. Okay, so let's let's go deeper into this objective. So um, here I've taken the log likelihood of a single example x. Now, if by the rules of probability, if I have to write the log likelihood assigned by the model to x, one way to write it is to first write the join distribution over x and z, and then marginalize out the contributions of z. So here, we are assuming Z is continuous, so we'll be doing an integration here. Now, if looking at this problem, one challenge is that even though each of these joint distributions could be tractable, so we could evaluate it for a single Z, then we have a high dimensional uh, or, or a continuous space for Z, then it might be very hard to be integrating it out analytically. So this challenge, what it necessitates is that what we're going to do is we look at a particular distribution, which is we call the posterior distribution. So this posterior distribution is can be extracted from the joint. So it's a, a distribution or a Z conditioned on X. And the key idea that we'll exploit is that this distribution, if we approximate it with something analytical, something simple like Q, and Q is something which we'll choose on our own, then this objective actually becomes tractable to optimize. Okay, so really uh, the name of the game is we're going to use inference. When I say inference is approximating the posterior is an inference task and we'll cast it as an optimization problem over the parameters theta and phi. Okay, so uh, let's look at how this works out in more detail. 
So we said that marginalizing out this joint distribution is going to be intractable. There are lots of Zs out here. So we'll do a, a simple math to derive a tractable objective. So what we do here is we multiply both the numerator and denominator by this distribution, which we are calling as the approximate posterior Q. Okay. So uh, Q, you can think of it, it takes in an X and then it maps it to a distribution over the latents itself. Now, by Jensen's inequality, we can then write an inequality, uh, which will basically push out this approximate distribution Q outside the log. So from Jensen's inequality, log of an expectation exceeds or is equal to the expectation uh, of the log of the term itself, okay? So uh, just by pushing out Q outside, we are left with this objective. Now this objective has something uh, nice going about it. In particular, we can write this objective as an expectation with respect to Q of the log of this quantity that we have here. So the, what we have gained by moving Q outside uh, this log is that now we can write an objective which can be expressed as a Monte Carlo expectation. An, an expectation that we can then approximate via Monte Carlo. Okay. So this objective is what we're gonna be calling as elbow. And what it stands for is the evidence lower bound of our data. So we had a data point X and for that data point X, we were able to use P and Q to write an objective uh, which looks like an expectation. Now, one question to ponder over is that when, does, when is this inequality tight? Okay. Because if this inequality is tight, we are good. We can optimize the original objective. And the condition which implies tightness of this inequality is if this distribution Q that we introduced matches the true posterior. So now you can see why we were actually calling it the approximate posterior, because if we are able to actually learn the true posterior P of Z given X, then we get back our uh, intended objective, which is the log marginal likelihood. Okay. So uh, effectively, if we move around some terms that we had previously, uh, what we see is that we have this elbow term that we derived as a lower bound to the log marginal likelihood. And the slack term is essentially given by the KL divergence between the approximate posterior Q and the true posterior P of Z given X. So the scale gap uh, is what uh, controls the quality of the approximation. So intuitively the visualization to keep in mind is that we have some log likelihood estimate here. And uh, for a fixed choice of theta, it's going to be constant. But what we're trying to do is then we're trying to optimize for the parameters phi such that the resulting lower bound, the elbow here, becomes tighter and tighter, hopefully uh, getting close to the true log marginal likelihood estimate. And what will control the quality of our approximation is how small is the KL gap between our evidence lower bound and the log marginal likelihood. So this gap here is the KL divergence between uh, Q of Z given X and P theta of Z given X. So in practice, uh, both theta and P are something we do not know. And this gives us an autoencoder perspective of thinking about this model. So here is again our learning objective, which is an expectation of the log of this quantity with respect to the approximate posterior Q. And we can decompose this term. So if we just uh, split apart the numerator and denominator and factorize the numerator, we get one term which corresponds to the expectation of the log of the conditional of P of X given Z. So one and another term, which is now the KL divergence between the approximate posterior Q of Z given X and some prior term P of Z. Now, we should think of this term as exactly the objective of an autoencoder. So in an autoencoder, you feed in 
an input x and you pass it through an encoding phase and after an encoding phase which we'll think of as parameterizing the distribution q we get a distribution over latents with parameters mu let's say if it's a gaussian we're going to have some mean parameters and we might have some variance sigma parameters so that's our distribution q and then what our goal is to use the z that we obtain by sampling from this distribution to reconstruct our original input x. So like in a typical autoencoder, we will try to minimize the squared error between the input and the output. If we assume that the output distribution p of x given z is a Gaussian, we'll get a similar objective here as well. The difference is, of course, the fact that the hidden layer here is stochastic. So instead of having a deterministic mapping from x to z and then z to x, in a variation autoencoder, the mapping from uh, x to z has some stochasticity because z is some random variable that we do not know. So what we're really learning is the parameters of the distribution over z. Uh, that's the first term. The second term, which is uh, the scale term hanging around there, so it's trying to bring the approximate posterior q of z given x close to some prior distribution over z. Okay, so the prior distribution over z is something that we can choose or we can also learn, but let's say we fix it to something having a simple chip that looks like a Gaussian. So what this is saying is that we want to regularize the distribution over z to look like that of a prior distribution, which in this case happens to be a single unimodal Gaussian. So that's the autoencoder perspective of how these models are typically learned. Uh, the architecture looks very much like a standard autoencoder, but the ob objective that we have here has some additional uh, nuances. So the Z here is stochastic, and we have an additional term here, which accounts for the KL uh, divergence between our approximate posterior and the prior that we have here. Okay. So uh, we discussed how we can learn by maximizing this evidence over bound. Uh, if, our, if, we can, if our encoder is very, very powerful and we recover the true posterior, this lower bound is tight. Uh, but even if in general that doesn't happen to be the case, we can still hope to get close to the true marginal log likelihood of the data. It's a directed model. So again, uh, we can do ancestral sampling. When we are sampling, we throw away the encoder. All the work is with the decoder. So we sample Z from some prior distribution. And then X can be sampled from the conditional of a distribution of X given Z, which is parameterized by the decoder. Uh, why did we introduce later variables in the first place? Uh, one useful thing about latent variable models especially in VEs, that we can use the encoder to then directly learn some representation of our input point X. So if we want to learn a representation uh, for, let's say, for clustering, for visualization, or for some downstream task, then all we have to do is we take any data point X and we pass it through our encoder. And then we look at what's the latent distribution that we learn over Z. And that latent distributions is going to contain some mean parameters and some uh, standard deviation if we assume the distribution to be a Gaussian. So, and these parameters themselves then become a representation for the input X that we can use for some downstream task. Okay, so uh, these models uh, have, there been a lot of progress over the years. This is uh, a work from just uh, last month where uh, a hierarchical version of this where we have multiple uh, layers of stochasticity, so not just one Z, but there are also uh, many, many layers of stochasticity within the model. If we apply, uh, if we use that model and then use some other training tricks, we can obtain very high resolution imagery once we have trained these models. Okay, so I also want to give in just one picture, what are some promising directions for extending these models in case some of you are interested. So essentially the name of the game for variational autoencoders is to approximate this posterior distribution P theta of Z given X with some tractable distribution Q of phi of Z given X. 
And the better we are at this approximation, the tighter will be our evidence lower bound. And we can hope to do better at the task of generative modeling if we are by solving this optimization problem. So some important questions that people have explored is, uh, how can we improve learning uh, such an, in such a regime by maybe having better optimization techniques? So we start with some initial start state for the encoder parameters phi, and then we're trying to uh, update both the encoder parameters from phi as well as the decoder parameters theta so that they get to some optimal theta star and phi star. And this in general can be a highly non-convex optimization problem. So thinking about what are good optimization techniques specifically for this objective is one way of, uh, one way of uh, making these models better. Uh, another line of research is thinking about how can we increase the size of these model families here. So we know that if we increase the size of these model families or find good ways of expressing them without having to overfit, we can then make sure that the distance between the proximate posterior and the true posterior gets minimized just by the fact that these models are very expressive and uh, they are likely to converge to a solution which has low KL divergence. Finally, um, why should we compare these distributions Q and P theta just by the KL divergence? So there's also been exciting works which look at how we can consider alternate ways of comparing these distributions using divergences which are other than the KL divergence. For instance, the Wasserstein divergence, the, the uh, Wasserstein distance, and uh, the maximum needs mean discrepancy, and all these various families of probabilistic divergences and distances that people have come up in other contexts as well. Okay, so this concludes our uh, variational order encoders. And uh, next we're gonna go into normalizing flow models. Uh, but again, before that, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them now. Hi Aditya, yes, I think there are a few questions that maybe uh, can be answered. Uh, on like in uh, online. So uh, the first one is: Do generative models do good extrapolation? That's a great question. So the question about uh, so generative models here. Uh, what we are so it's the first thing is like how do we define extrapolation? So if you're thinking about extrapolation in the context of data generation, so maybe one notion of extrapolation could be that oh, if I see a model that's trained on let's say blue circles and red triangles. Do we expect the model to generate blue triangles? That would be some form of maybe uh, extrapolation in some sense. It never saw that during training, uh, but it's trying to then generate something that's new. And uh, the short answer to that is, it depends on what inductive biases are base, baked into the model. So if the inductive biases, for instance, is invariant to um, the combinations of colors and uh, let's say shapes in this particular toy example that I made up, then sure it's possible that it disentangles those factors in the training set and even during test time then it's able to make up these new combinations of uh, shapes and colors that it never saw during training. So um, yeah, it really depends on what inductive biases you bake into the different architectures that you use for these models. Any other questions? Um, yeah, so uh, another one is, uh, can you summarize the difference between variational autoencoders and autoencoders? Yes, so I, as I said, there are two differences and uh, this slide illustrates them best. So here, uh, if let's, let's see what a regular autoencoder would do. It would take some input, it would pass it through an encoder and uh, the output of the encoder will be some compressed representation of the input X and it will use that compressed representation directly to then reconstruct the input during the decoding phase. Now in a variational autoencoder, uh, the computational flow looks almost the same. Uh, there's one difference, which is that when you pass an image through an encoder, what you get as the output is a distribution over uh, 
the latent variable z. Okay, so it's not deterministic, so it's a distribution. So during the decoding phase, you will sample from that distribution to get a value for z, and then you'll pass it through the decoder as before. So that's the one way in which um, the forward pass through the variational autoencoder differs from a regular autoencoder. And then another difference which comes about when we're actually trying to learn uh, this model via backpropagation is that the objective not just contains a reconstruction error term, which also occurs in a regular autoencoder, but there's an additional term which comes about from the elbow objective, which tries to regularize the approximate posterior Q of Z given X, which is what the encoder learns with some prior distribution over Z. So this is an additional piece of the puzzle that we have to pick. So we have to pick some prior over how we want our latent codes to be. So if we believe the latent codes should look like a Gaussian, we can set this to be a Gaussian. And this term would ensure that uh, if we maximize the elbow, we'll have to minimize the scale divergence. So we'll try to regularize our encoder outputs to look close to that of a Gaussian. So those are the two differences. We have many, many more questions. <laughs> so uh, maybe we can take uh, one or two more and then um, uh, see how we can move on. Um, uh, the other one is, so autoregressive models try to build relationship from earlier data to later data. This seems like the model will depend on what you decide is earlier. Like in the case of image pixels, is the direction chosen in training? or do people build ensemble of models using different directions? That's an excellent question. So the question, uh, just to paraphrase a bit, when we're discussing autoregressive models, so uh, let me go back to that slide so it becomes clearer. So here we have to pick an ordering of the dimensions of X. So from X1 to X2, so on to X1. Uh, who picks that ordering? Now that ordering is something that we decide uh, beforehand. So in the case of, let's say, images, the ordering is typically raster scan. So you start from the first pixel on the top left, and then you go uh, within a row, uh, and then you go on to the next row and so on and forth, and that way you specify an ordering. There have been works which are order agnostic. So I can link the references on Slack offline, but there are also works which then consider that's an ensemble of models or how to have parameterizations which can then be agnostic to the ordering that you choose. Good question, yeah, anything else? One more, um, what's the benefit or specific use case of using autoregressive models seeing as they will always be much more expensive for training as compared to VAEs or GANs? Uh, so, uh, the question is that, uh, I'll, I'll pose it as a question, uh, which is slightly different, which is, uh, are there any benefits to using autoregressive models? Uh, so the benefits of autoregressive models are that these are actually very, very expressive. So if the conditionals could represent any distribution, then the overall joint probability could also approximate any distribution. So this is just by the chain rule. So by the chain rule, we can write the joint probability as a product of these conditionals. So if we make these theta or the neural networks very, very expressive, we can actually represent any distribution over X. Uh, these models are generally amongst the state of the art in terms of likelihood assignment. Um, so while these and GANs have other nice properties like GANs are good for sampling, uh, VAs have recently begun to do good at sampling, but earlier they've also been used to infer latent representation Z. Um, these models are good at assigning high likelihoods. So for tasks such as anomaly detection or just generally any kind of application that builds upon density estimation, uh, these models are very useful. Maybe uh, we can take more questions later. There are still like many of them but uh, we can see yeah. how much time we have later yeah sounds good so yeah. uh next i want to discuss uh the last uh variant of likelihood based general model which is called a normalizing flow model so 
when I look at the graphical model for a normalizing flow model, it looks exactly like that of uh, what we had for VAs. So there is a latent variable Z, and then there's some observed variables X. But we'll make one change, which is that uh, we will think of Z mapping to X in a deterministic and invertible manner, okay? So instead of having some arbitrary mapping between Z and X, we'll say that Z and X will have the same dimensionality. So both will be n-dimensional objects. And the way we can transform a sample from the prior distribution over Z to a sample of X will be via deterministic and invertible mapping, which I'm denoting as F theta. Okay. So because it's invertible by design, if you want to get Z, once we have an X, we just use the inverse of F to get back our Z. Okay. So uh, let's look at an example. So for example, uh, we could have Z, the distribution over Z uh, being denoted uniformly over the square. And now if we apply a transformation to it, in this case, the transformation is basically multiplying by uh, a two cross two matrix with entries A, B, C, and D. Uh, what we'll essentially end up with is the uniform distribution over Z, all the probability mass gets redistributed to that of a parallelogram. So this is something we have seen uh, probably in um, uh, high school or in, um, uh, uh, in college where applying a matrix transformation can uh, shear the original uh, distribution, which in this case is uniform over the square to represent that of let's say a parallelogram. So uh, more formally, the term that we're more familiar with is called the change of variables. So what change of variables does is that it relates densities in one space to another uh, by this formula. So if we want to find out what is the probability of some data point X, in the space defined by this random variable big X, we can write this probability density as the product of the prior density over Z times the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian of the inverse of F with respect to X, okay? So this is uh, the additional term that controls how much do the volumes change as we move from the space of Z to the space of X. Okay. So like in this case, if we go from the space of Z to space of X, you can see that there's a change in volume. The square here has a different volume than the parallelogram here. And this Jacobian term essentially controls that change in volume. Okay. So these transformations uh, F here, they are essentially, one can think of them as shaping a prior density uh, why are these volume expansions and contractions done to then approximate or get closer and closer to the true data density? And mathematically, this is the Jacobian term. And here we're looking at the absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian, which uh, quantifies precisely what's the per unit change in volume uh, when we go from Z to X via the mapping F. Now that's the, so one thing to notice about this expression is that this density is already normalized. So if Z was normalized, we can pick any invertible transformation F and the distribution that we get for X is going to be a normalized distribution. So it's going to integrate to one, it's going to be positive. So uh, we get tractability for free, which was not the case when we had variational autoencoders. So remember in variational autoencoders, we had it was intractable to get the marginal uh, likelihood over X. So what we did was we considered an evidence lower bound to the marginal log likelihood. But here by constraining F to be invertible, we can just apply the change of variables formula and get a normalized distribution for free. Now, the other thing that you see in this uh, terminology is that it's called the flow. And the reason why it's called the flow is because these invertible transformations F theta can actually be composed with each other. So if you apply, uh, if you compose invertible transformations, 
the result is another invertible transformation. So you can then apply the, ch uh, the change of variables one more time, and you, you can keep doing this until you do it for all the, let's say one, two, up to big M of transformations, and you can still get a normalized model at the output just by using the change of variables formula here. So what do these transformations do? We said that geometrically they seem to be uh, shrinking uh, or uh, shearing uh, or uh, expanding uh, the probability densities in a geometric sense. So here's an example where uh, a bunch of these invertible transformations were applied. And what they did was if we start with m equals zero, which means we have no transformation. So we're just looking at the prior density of uh, Z0, that was a Gaussian distributions. But as we successfully applied more of these transformations, we can see that the shape of the distribution starts changing. So these contours uh, start reflecting uh, more complex patterns, which could be a better approximation to the data at hand for which this model was trained. So with just 10 transformations, we have seen that we can learn very complex distributions using these models. Okay, so uh, how do we learn the parameters of these transformations that we apply? Um, well, uh, we have the log marginal likelihood in closed forms, so we can just use the maximum likelihood estimation objective without having to do with uh, variational inference. So this is similar to how we were exactly optimizing for the log likelihood in the case of an autoregressive model. And uh, we can see that by using change of variables, formula, uh, we can get a handle on the exact likelihoods. Now, this was the learning aspect. At test time, we want to do inference with this model. And one task we've been considering is that, let's say we want to sample from this model. So it's a direct latent variable model. So we know we can use ancestral sampling. So we sample Z from some prior distribution over Z. And then to get the actual sample X, we pass it through the invertible transformation F. Uh, we can also think of the inference task where we want to infer the latent representation Z for uh, an X that we feed to the model. In that case, again, uh, we can now use uh, the inverse of F and apply that to X in order for us to be able to obtain the latent representation Z. Okay. So these models um, have also demonstrated a lot of success and uh, here is uh, one of these models, GLOW. So the main uh, area of research within normalizing flow models is how do we specify these invertible transformations F. And GLOW here again used a variant of 1D convolutions where they were able to obtain uh, samples which can do very well at um, interpolating across different latent attributes. For example, uh, here are the two authors of this paper. So this is Dirk Kingma, who was also one of the co-inventors of VAEs. And here's Praful Dharwal, who was also on this paper. And now if we see how running this model, we can interpolate across the different latent attributes. So for the same person, we can vary attributes such as the presence of a beard, the hair color, and so on and forth. Okay, so this was what I want to talk about normalizing flow models. Um, and um, I will again take a brief stop for one or two questions before I move on to talking about, about GANs. Okay. Um, I, I think this question is still in the context of uh, the VAEs. So it's asking what is the difference between a variational autoencoder and an adversarial autoencoder, or I think. Okay, so uh, we haven't talked about adversarial learning, but we'll do that next. Uh, but um, an adversarial autoencoder essentially optimizes for a different divergence from KL divergence in the latent space. So like I said, one of the areas of research within VAEs, uh, let me go back to this slide, is thinking about 
uh, whether KL divergence is the right notion of divergence between our approximate posterior Q and our true posterior P. And in an adversarial autoencoder, they basically have a different mechanism of using an adversarial training objective with an additional uh, discriminator in the latent space that allows you to then have more flexibility in the kind of divergences you can specify to compare Q and P. Would you like to take another question or um, uh, answer them later? Uh, maybe you can take it later in the interest okay. of time. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so, uh, all right. So the last I want to talk about amongst the different families of generative models is uh, GANs, or generative adversarial networks. So uh, when I talk about GANs uh, or teach about it, there are like many, many different perspectives with which you can uh, think about GANs. The perspective that I like to think uh, best summarizes as GANs is um, it's a likelihood-free model. So all the models that we saw so far, whether it was autoregressive models or VEs, or whether it was normalizing to models, they were trying to approximate the log likelihood of the data, either ex or in the case of autoregressive models and flow models, that was exact. We could exactly get the log likelihood assigned by the model. In the case of VE, we had to think of variational approximations to that. Now, we can also think of models and training objectives, which do not require the likelihood. Okay. So uh, let's, if you see this picture, this discrepancy, if we have a likelihood model, this discrepancy is essentially the KL divergence. And now what we're going to see is in GANs, a different view of specifying this discrepancy. So how it looks like is that, again, we want to find some generative model between, within some model family M. But the way we specify the differences between the general model and the true data distribution is by looking at samples from the data distribution P data and the generative model P gen. And for these samples, we'll then compare their expectations of some function F. So F is some function. So you can think of it might be, let's say, a mean function. So you look at samples from the data distribution, you look at samples from the general model, you compare their means. So that's going to be the first order moments. So you can compare the second order moments and so on. Forth. In a lot of cases, you can specify the family of functions f for which you want to make this comparison. And we want to be able to find the general model, which even for the worst choice of f, the worst choice of F is one which makes the data distribution generative model look very, very different. We are able to then find the best generative model. Okay. So this is our notion of how we compare a data distribution and a general model. We specify some family of functions F, and then we find the member of this family F, which maximizes the difference in expectations with respect to the data distribution and the general model. Now, uh, different choices of F lead to popular discrepancy metrics uh, that have existed for many, many uh, decades and years and have been used in probability theory for a very long time. For instance, if we pick F to be the class of bounded RKHSs that occur within the kernel literature, what we get is a maximum mean discrepancy metric. And similarly, by choosing different s, we can get the total relation difference, uh, distance, and we can get the Wasserstein time distance as well. Okay, so this is the learning objective. So it's, I call it the two sample testing because it's comparing two sets of samples, one from the data distribution, one from the general model. Notice that here, when we specify this objective, we never made use of the likelihood here. So we never asked the, while trying to evaluate this objective, what is P gen of X, which would have been the likelihood? So this is a key difference. This is a likelihood free objective. So how does this work in practice? So in practice, we will have a generator uh, which will take in some, it's a latent wave model. So it will start with some random Gaussian noise. We'll pass it through this generator and we'll get some uh, output X here. 
which would probably look like an image we want to generate. Uh, but how do we make sure that the generator parameters are optimized to uh, in this minimax fashion? We will have another network here, which we call as the critic network, or often people think of it as a discriminator. Um, what this critic is going to do is it's going to distinguish the samples that we get from the generator. So that's going to be this term here with the samples that we get from the data distribution, which is the first term in this objective. So what it's essentially going to do is then compare these two samples. So since there are two sets of samples, it's going to basically be making a binary decision whether a sample that it observes is real or fake. So real examples are those that come from the data distribution and the fake ones are what we might get from the generator here. This does not really look like a monument, but this generator is trying to fool the critic into making it believe that it is. Okay. So now during learning, both the generator and the critic are updated alternatively. So uh, here is an example from the original GAN paper. So we have some Z here, which is pictorially depicted on this uh, 1D line, and it maps to some Xs here. Okay. So the generator distribution initially is denoted in this green. Uh, 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 yeah, and what we're trying to do is we are trying to approximate this distribution in black, which is our data distribution here. Now, what we do is first we update the critic. So what we're gonna do is we'll have this critic, which in this case is this blue line. So this blue line is distinguishing the samples from the data distribution, so these dotted black points, from the samples that we would get from the general distribution, which would be the ones concentrated around this Gaussian here on the right-hand side. So the discriminator assigns high probability to the real examples and low ones to the fake. So this, after we updated the critic, we'll then try to execute the optimization over the generator parameters. So the generator then tries to fool the critic. So it will move the learn distribution closer to the data distribution so that it hard, becomes harder for the critic to then distinguish between these two distributions. We can keep repeating this process where we update the critic so that it distinguishes between these two sets of distribution, the samples from these two distributions and we can then update the generator to then try to make the task harder for the critic. And if at convergence under some idealized conditions, we'll find that the generator distribution matches the uh, true data distribution. Okay. Now, uh, so this is how learning works. We can also think about inference. So uh, I, like I said, the, the way we learn these models is by a likelihood free objective. So if we really care about the likelihoods, we might actually not have access to them in a tractable manner. There are some exceptions we can consider. So if you do consider the class of invertible models like we did in flow, in that case, we can also evaluate the likelihoods. Uh, there's, this is a directed model. So if we want to sample from this model, we first sample from the prior distribution. Again, we can assume it's a Gaussian distribution and then pass it through and the generator mapping to then obtain our data, uh, the generated uh, sample in the data space. Okay, so over the years, GANs have made rapid strides in sample quality. So uh, around the time when I started my PhD, the original GAN paper came about in 2014. And every year since then, it's been um, higher resolution, harder to detect whether each of these samples are actually real. And one might actually think that, oh, have these models really passed what can think of as the generation Turing test where it's becoming harder and harder for us as humans to distinguish between these uh, real examples from the data set and these fake individuals that are being coming from a model. Uh, there are noticeable artifacts in some of these generations that we do not see in some of these cherry picked examples. So I still feel there's a lot more to be done to actually pass the generation Turing test, but still the speed of progress over the years has just been fantastic. 
uh, these models are used for so many different tasks. Uh, this is one uh, really impressive task for which these models were applied. So here what was done was we have two sets of samples. So we might have the paintings of Monet and we might have the photographs uh, that we might have clicked ourselves from on our camera. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn mappings from one set of images to another. So we can think about, oh, how would the a painting of Monet look like if it was in the real world, a real photograph? And we can use um, a conditional GAN in this case to then translate this image, uh, this painting of Monet to an actual photograph. So again, another example is, let's say we have a data set of zebras and a data set of horses, and we wanna think about, okay, how would uh, in the same scene, if we had these zebras, if they were actually horses, how would these look like? And again, we can uh, use this translation. We can also do it in the reverse direction. So you might have a horse and we wanna see, oh, what if this horse was actually a zebra in the same environment? And again, we can uh, use a conditional GAN for these translations. Okay, so this uh, finishes uh, what I wanted to say about um, uh, generative adversarial networks. Uh, and um, I wanna spend uh, maybe five minutes or so on talking about the different kinds of scientific applications, which might be of interest to a lot of people attending this virtual seminar, as well as uh, give some concluding thoughts about what are exciting research directions, both from an algorithmic and from a practical perspective with these models. Uh, before I do those, um, uh, are there any questions about GANs that I can answer? Specifically about GANs, okay, let me see. Um, or other models is also good. Uh, yeah, so one question about uh, other models, I think in the, in the content around the VAE, so uh, the question here is, what if the assumption of Gaussian distribution goes wrong? Uh, do we always uh, assume Gaussian? I think this is for the prior. Uh, good question. The question is, uh, let's go back here. So here we said we have to assume something for the prior distribution. And uh, I said that, oh, we can let it be a standard Gaussian, standard normal distribution. Uh, what if that's not a good distribution? Indeed, there is um, a lot of works and I can link them offline uh, where learning the prior distribution as opposed to keeping it fixed to be a Gaussian can actually give a lot of uh, improvements in uh, the performance of these models. So there have been uh, works in fact, uh, which often think of this prior as being an autoregressive model in itself. So instead of having uh, a standard Gaussian distributions, which is not assuming any correlational structure amongst the dimensions of Z, you can actually enforce them to have an autoregressive dependency. And that uh, does very, very well for some advanced variants of these models. Maybe one more question since we're talking about the, um, you're just finished with GANs. How do you make equilibrium between the generator and discriminator? Uh, okay, another, another great question. And this is one of the pressing um, um, research directions within the GANs, which is that in practice, this minimax optimization problem is uh, very hard to solve, even for very simple choices of uh, the model family that we pick for the generator and discriminator, this can be very hard. And uh, when that is the case, then uh, doing this alternating minimax optimization problem might often give you, make you land at points where there is, uh, the generator is just producing essentially garbage output because the optimization has failed. The discriminator could be very, very powerful and the gradients might not be back propagating to the generator in a suitable manner. Uh, so that's uh, often that's called as mode collapse. So if you might have, some of you might have heard of this. So what happens in mode collapse is essentially the generative model uh, starts generating only one sample and it just affixes on the sample. And no matter how long you train it, that one sample that it generates does not change. So 
uh, that's a persistent problem with GANs and an active area of research about what are different optimization techniques that can be used other than the vanilla gradient descent in an alternating fashion that people use. So uh, if I have to just pick one of them, so another thing that helps is uh, in optimization is thinking about what this function class F is. So for instance, it's been shown in recent work that if F corresponds to uh, what would lead this objective to correspond to the Wasserstein distance. So essentially, if you have some sort of Lipschitz continuity on your critics, then you can stably optimize for this optimization problem in practice. But these are empirical observations and the theory around this is still leaves a lot for improvement. I guess this touches uh, on another question. What benefits do you see the Wasserstein distance having? Um, yeah, so like I mentioned here that empirically people have seen that when you use the Wasserstein distance, it has uh, better uh, geometries. So it, it accounts for the geometry unlike a lot of these divergences, scale divergences, which are invariant to reparameterizations. And that, in a sense, uh, stabilizes optimization and gives better results in practice. If you'd like to take one more question. Uh, sure. Uh, how are we doing on time? I need about five more minutes. I, I think no, we're doing very well. It's um, uh, it's a uh, ten forty, so we still have twenty minutes. Okay, that day yeah, we can take another question. Yeah, uh, the question is on GANs, and it's or generally um, not just GANs. Uh, how do you calculate the approximate number of modes in your data set? Oh yeah, uh, I I really like this question, uh, and that, that's a beef I've had also for a long while, which is. Um, what is modes of the distribution that, uh, and how do we calculate it? So uh, let me give some context for everyone to follow. For instance, here, um, so what is a mode? So mode is any region of the distribution which has high probability mass. So for instance, it's a mixture of two Gaussians. So there are two modes of the distribution. But in this case, um, we know that there are two modes because we cheated in this toy example because we knew what the data distribution was. Now, in practice, if I see a real data distribution, like let's say I see these images of monuments, then it's hard for me to say how many modes are there in such high dimensional distributions. So the short answer is that it's hard to say of what a mode could mean in high dimensions when we only have samples from the distribution. Um, but what people do when they're evaluating these models is there's a suit of uh, synthetic tasks where you can pick the data distribution. So they usually are like mixture of 40 Gaussians and so on and forth. And those tasks also are like first steps to benchmarking your favorite generative model. So you see how well it covers those 40 modes in a mixture of 40 Gaussians. And uh, that will give you some sense of how much mode covering behavior that exists in that model. For real distributions, um, you would uh, for real, you would have to make some sort of approximations of what your mode could correspond to. For example, if you have label data sets, so let's say if you uh, had labels, let's say in ImageNet or in uh, CIFAR or these kinds of data sets, you can think about how many examples are being generated from each of these different classes. So there the notion of mode is, could be typically approximated by the number of classes that exist uh, within the data set. And again, that's a bit heuristic and that only applicable to um, uh, labeled data sets. So we don't use the labels during training, but we need them if you want to do some kind of evaluation. Uh, for more general distribution, this remains an active area of research about how do you evaluate uh, the mode covering or mode uh, seeking behavior of a generative model. Okay, maybe we can leave uh, some of the other questions to, for later. That sounds good. Yes. Okay, so um, yeah, so now um, uh, so general models uh, uh, are have been used in many, many, many applications. Uh, and one broad class of applications, which is very appealing to scientists especially, is the use of these models for uh, discovery. And uh, 
here is just a very small, small subset of works which have used uh, generative models in the sciences. So I'm just going to read out some of these titles. So for example, um, here, is, uh, the, here is an example where the first paper here, Physics of Aware Deep Gender Models for Creating Synthetic Microstructures. So what these models did was they infused some uh, physical structure within the generative model and they used it for materials discovery. In this case, those materials corresponded to microstructures. Um, the second work, uh, this is a very prominent work. So this was one of the first works which showed how you can do, uh, let's say, drug discovery using these models. So what happened in these models, they used a variational autoencoding style of framework. So in the latent space, they essentially performed Bayesian optimization and any time you had to uh, actually see what that latent vector corresponds to, they would try to use the decoder of the model to get it back into the observed space. So this way they were able to tackle the course of dimensionality for Bayesian optimization by mapping these high dimensional drug molecules into a low dimensional latent space and performing Bayesian optimization in that latent space. And this style of technique has since then been used for so many different kinds of discovery applications in uh, biology and materials sciences, where you try to project down these high dimensional structures into a low dimensional latent space and then do Bayesian optimization within that latent space. Uh, this work here uh, you, uh, is another class of application that's emerging very prominently. Here, the authors are trying to use GANs for compressed sensing. So inverse problems is another area of research. So in inverse problems, uh, essentially like compressed sensing, you have a very high dimensional vector like an image and what you observe are measurements which are very low dimensional. So you're essentially trying to solve an under constrained problem where looking at those low dimensional measurements, you want to reconstruct the high dimensional signal. So this, would typically happen in MRI. Uh, it's very slow uh, to get measurements. So only a few measurements, you want to reconstruct what the original image would look like. And for many years, people have explored solutions based on sparsity-based assumptions, whereas generative models provide a different kind of prior. So instead of saying that we are going to look at only images which are, let's say, sparse in some basis, we are saying we are only going to look at images which can be represented by a general model. And typically that kind of assumptions work better for solving under constrained problems when we have access to some framed data sets. Um, then uh, some more applications. So this is an application of trying to use uh, generative models for generating synthetic images of astronomical objects. So there are also other works which have looked at how Gender models can be used to form hypotheses of about uh, outer space. And again, those hypotheses have then since been validated in the, in, uh, in the true conditions and often they give out uh, positive results. So uh, we can see lots and lots of different applications and we should then think about like, okay, what is really a generative modeling doing? And I think of generative models as doing a one of three things and everything else about it is derivative. The first thing a general model does is it helps you generate data. So anytime you want to generate, let's say synthetic data or you want to do discovery of some sort, you can try to think of a general model being useful for that kind of application. And the second thing a general model does is it assigns probability to an external data point. So this is typically what we would think of density estimation. So if you want to think of applications where you need to see what's the probability assigned by a model to a data point, you would use a general model. So a good example there is in anomaly detection. So if you want to detect anomalies in your data set, you can see if the general model that's trained on the data set will assign low probabilities to a test anomaly point. So that will provide you with some intuition about whether that point is an anomaly and not belonging to the training distribution. So that's second. So first was sampling, second was density estimation, and third is learning a good representation. So we saw that in the case of latent variable models. Often, if we have like very high dimensional data, we can try to project it down to low dimensional latent space 
and we can try to do a reasoning in that low dimensional space. So this is what, for instance, this work on automatic chemical design does. It tries to project uh, high dimensional molecules which are discrete and hard to work with into a low dimensional space that's continuous and good for Bayesian optimization. Okay, so what's next for deep generative models? Uh, there are uh, many, many directions of research. Uh, here is my bias collection of a few. Uh, so first I think that there are new model families emerging yet still. So in spite of so much progress, people are still continuing to make rapid advancements. Uh, one class of models, which I did not discuss in this tutorial, but is rapidly coming up, is thinking about, in a sense, energy-based models. So these are unnormalized models. So they were very popular actually 15 years back. So if you've heard of terms like Boltzmann machines or um, uh, just restricted Boltzmann machines or Markov random fields, so these are essentially unnormalized models often called as energy-based models. And recently they have had a resurgence. So there have been different ways in which these models have been learned. Some of those are mentioned here. And then there are also objectives, for instance, in score matching, you're trying to match the gradients of the data distribution as opposed to the data distribution itself, which are again coming up. So there's still a lot to do in thinking about new models uh, beyond these GANs and flows. And often these models perform much better than what ex already exists out there. Uh, the second, I think it's very important to think of evaluation metrics for generative modeling, in particular for how do you evaluate samples in representation learning. So unlike classification or regression, like the traditional machine learning setting where we want to make predictions, where it's clear we have a train set, we have a validation set for hyperparameter tuning of the model that's uh, being trained, and then we have a test set on which we measure generalization. Uh, these are not so clear when we're thinking about how do we evaluate a bunch of samples we get from the model, or, or the representation that is learned in an unsupervised manner without any downstream task in mind. So thinking about these evaluation metrics um, continues to be an area of progress. There are some existing metrics that people are using, but they also have some deficiencies which could be improved upon. Um, the third is we are seeing increasing applications of these models in the real world. And because it's trained, often these models are trained on unsupervised land, you can train them on much bigger and bigger data sets, which is very promising. So for instance, you might have seen the GPT model that was trained on um, basically text that was scraped from the internet. But there's also uh, a reason for concern with these models is often the data sets that they might be using might be easily accessible, but they might be biased in ways that uh, we do not expect them to be. So they could, for instance, if you're scraping text for the internet, they could be biases with respect to uh, race and gender. And these kinds of biases then get inherited by the general model itself. And in fact, the general model is used to then generate more data, so it's amplifying those biases. So, uh, there is some, again, some recent work here, which finds very promising approaches to then counter this kind of bias without having to explicitly ask for label annotations. So you can, that's another area of research, which is that how do we make sure that these models uh, are not amplifying, but instead mitigating the biases that exist within the diverse data sources these models can be trained upon. Finally, I think we have only scratched the surface of what applications of these models could be. Um, you know, these, I, I feel there are so many different ways in which people have already used these models, but so many more areas which could benefit from these models. So lately I've been seeing a lot of work in causal discovery and inference using these models um, uh, with additional assumptions on the kind of inductive biases you want these models to inherit. Uh, these models, uh, especially latent waiver models, are also being used for model-based reinforcement learning methods. So if you have a general model of the dynamics of the world, you can use that model to then plan and make decisions in um, high dimensional environments. And um, I mentioned few applications in scientific discovery, but they continue to be an increasing variety of different applications where these models could be used for um, discovering 
uh, new kinds of objects of interest um, and getting more synthetic data in data limited environments and many such applications. So if uh, you're interested in learning more details about these models, uh, I also taught a course on deep general models uh, two years ago. This is the latest iteration of the course. All our uh, course notes and our uh, slides and are present on this website. So uh, you'll find much more information about uh, how you can um, learn these different kinds of general models if you check out this link. Uh, so with that, I would like to uh, end this talk and I'll also take some more questions. Uh, Lydia, thank you very, very much for um, yeah, this very informative lecture. Actually, it's very clear and, and well put. Thank you. Um, I think we, we took so many questions and um, maybe we can choose uh, a couple more. Um, one of them is, I think you touched on this towards the end of your lecture, essentially is asking if, um, if we somehow since like, yeah, the progress has been going um, drastically fast and dramatically fast, um, but there are a lot of ethical implications that come with these uh, applications. Do you think we should stop actually? Should we should curtail progress on these applications to, um, um, to avoid this, this technology being used for like in a malicious fashion? Uh, so a uh, great question and um, yeah, I briefly touched upon this and that's something which um, I personally have also um, been working towards. I do feel that technology is always a double-edged sword. It, there, on one hand, we can see uh, general models having so many use cases in decision-making and scientific discovery. At the same time, uh, these models do raise ethical concerns as well. Uh, but that, as a researcher, I think that provides us with a an opportunity to then think about how to counteract these adversarial effects. So uh, for instance, in this particular work, uh, they are considering how general models such as GPT and they're trained on so many different data sources from the internet. How do we make sure that the outputs are not biased with respect to race and gender? And they have a way in which you have a small representative set and using that representative set, you can actually train on much bigger data sets like the internet and still make sure that the learned model will not have as much biases as exist in the internet. So the, even the ethical questions that are emerging from these kinds of models present us with an opportunity to then tackle those questions and make sure that these models are then better used for um, good as opposed to malicious use cases. Uh, uh, a lot of you might have also heard about deep fake technology that's becoming increasingly popular. Uh, and it's, it's an increasing area of concern for um, governments, for lawmakers, for general uh, individuals as us. We don't know what to trust, what not to trust when we see, let's say, images on the web. Are these real? Are these fake? Are they trying to fool us? And um, uh, with these models, it's becoming easier and easier to make these kinds of fake data. And uh, yes, that's an area of concern, but also an active area of research where we're trying to come up with ways to uh, solve some of these ethical concerns. Yeah, any other question? Maybe one last question. I mean, there are a few questions on uh, essentially the pros and cons of different models. Uh, maybe you can choose one of them. Essentially, is asking what are the target problems for VAEs and GANs, and how would you choose, or if there are certain metrics that would help you choose between them for a certain application? Uh, yeah, I, I like this question, uh, especially as a practitioner. Uh, often, uh, you have to, uh, let's say I have a data set, I want to learn a general model. What should I use? Should I use an autoregression model, or V, a GAN, a flow, or what? And I feel like um, there are some rules of thumb. They're not strict, so don't quote me on this. Um, I know this is being recorded, but people who work on other generative models might uh, feel strongly when I say this, but it's usually like if you're using that model, let's say for density estimation, um, and then an autoregressive model would be a good first bet. Uh, 
if you're using those models for, uh, let's say, getting good quality samples, then it's easier to get a GAN working for that. Um, okay, not always easy to get it working, but you can actually hope that once it works, it will give you very good results. Uh, VEs, for instance, are very stable to learn. So uh, often you, you might need a lot of work to, for it to generate really high quality samples or give you good likelihood estimates. But if you want to get something working in some sense um, fairly well, it, it's, it's relatively easy to get a VE uh, working on your custom data set. So yeah, I feel like uh, that, yeah, you, but these rules of thumbs are good starting points, but essentially you need to do more exploration uh, if you want to get like really high quality results with the different families of general models. I think um, there are many more questions on the uh, Q and A, uh, and I would suggest that um, maybe um, um, uh, you know the audience can ask these questions on the Slack channel dedicated to this lecture, and then um, uh, Aditya or others can um, chime in on these questions. Yeah, Aditya, thank you so much for taking all of these questions and uh, and thanks for everyone for their excellent questions. I think uh, they were they probed this many dimensions of um, you know how generative models are used and uh, the problems of actually training them in practice. And Aditya, thank you again for for this great lecture. And um, yeah, we hope to have you also on the on the Slack channel um, uh, in case um, yeah, the audience have more questions. Yeah, thank you if very you much for having me here. And I'd be happy to take more questions on uh, Slack and even offline via emails. Okay, thank you. Thank you again. Thanks everyone. And um, we'll meet next week.